Welcome to the Doctors of Running Virtual Roundtable, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, discuss the art and the science of the stuff that we put on our feet. Today, we are recording episode number 75. 75. Oh, I had to double nice. check. <laughs> 70, that's actually kind of a big, a big episode number. Hopefully, it lives yeah, up no to kidding. the hype. But today at the round table is just Matt and I. Uh, we're actually recording on a Friday. We usually record on Sunday, so this is a little bit earlier in our recording cycle. Um, DJ or David, he spending the weekend with his girlfriend. It's her birthday. I can talk about this because it will come out after. But he has some surprises lined up for her, and right. so he's not able to join us because he's got a busy weekend ahead, um, right. which is pretty cool. So today's episode, we're going to be covering a number of different things. We're going to go through our subjective uh, question of the week, which is coming up first, but then we're going to be talking about rocker souls, who benefits from them, who doesn't, and then obviously going into what they are, what does the research say about them. We might even dive into some research methods and what we do when we see conflicting evidence on things like like this with rockers and other types of, of research and shoe studies. So that should be a lot of fun. And then we're finally going to finish with a review of a shoe that Matt has done all of his testing on, and we will dive into that shoe at the end. So let's start off with our subjective question of the week. It is the Winter Olympics time. We're in the midst of it. And so we just wanted to do, this is a pretty lighthearted question, but the question of the week, the subjective is, what is your favorite Winter Olympic sport? Um, there are a lot of great sports out there. And we always end up talking about sports a little bit anyway. And what I wanted is going to bring up this week is how amazing it was to watch um, Nathan Chen and Chloe Kim. This week, it was just amazing. Like when you have people who who are, don't even necessarily perform their best and they still blow everyone else out of the water, it's just crazy to watch people perform at that level. If you haven't watched Nathan Chen's short program, he set a world record score um, in his short program. And then his free skate was phenomenal. And he's just, I feel like he, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a figure skater and I'm not in the figure skating world. So forgive me. But, uh, I feel like he's someone who's taken that sport and made it feel really modern and approachable. Um, he used like an Elton John medley for his free skate. I just thought it was amazing. Really good dancer too. So he, he was phenomenal. Also, his first name is Nathan. That's cool. The other uh, really good skater from the U.S. is Jason Brown. So it's like I share a name with both of them. So maybe I should get into figure skating. That's what I'm thinking about. Also, then Chloe Kim going out with her first run. And I feel like she nailed her first run. They said immediately afterwards she won the gold. And she didn't even do her biggest tricks. And I feel like if you can secure a gold medal without like performing your best stuff, you're just at this whole other level. It was super cool. So she's awesome too. And tons of other cool stories. So maybe, yeah, we want to hear what your favorite winter Olympic sport is and maybe a cool um, story you've, you've seen or a cool event. So Matt, what would you say your favorite is? I think by far each year has been any of the cross country skiing stuff. Cause that's what I, being from Oregon and being from the mountain areas, grew up cross country skiing was not elite at the level. It's always awesome to watch. And then also the physiology, cause I'm a nerd. Um, going on yeah. behind how hard those athletes are pushing. And like, so for those that don't know across the board, cross country skiers typically have the highest VO two maxes of any athlete. And if you watch them performing, it's just like, Oh yeah, that's why like every single one, when they cross the finish line, they just collapse and you're like, wow. So that, I think it's, that's by far one of my favorites to watch at the last Olympics when the women's, I think it was the women's relay when Diggins was coming to the line and the announcer was just like, here comes Diggins, here comes Diggins. I remember just like tearing up and oh, I was so good. There's awesome. so many good things. Um, yeah. So th that's a great one. I think mine, uh, Casper, our audio engineer said this was his as well. Um, but the short track speed skating, uh, is definitely top notch in my book. And, especially the relays where there, it's just like mass chaos out there. And like the way that they hit these tight corners and they're like within like inches or they're like grazing up against other people. And there's tons of times where people will, you know, have a fault and then they, a bunch of people go spinning out. I just think the sport is super exciting and like chaotic looking and super smooth. So it's super, it's, it's really fun. And when they, when they pass either on the inside or the outside, the burst of like speed that they can get on the, in these small short track stuff, it's super fun to watch. But the Winter Olympics is super unique because it's, it's not like these sports you see all the time all year round. It's like these very technical 
uh, events where people are like working on this one specific skill uh, and a lot, and even sometimes like the curlers are like dentists and pharmacists and they also curl on the side and like go to the Olympics. <laughs> Maybe that's not true everywhere, but you hear those stories. And I just think that's cool to like have people who are just doing life in a community performing on a world stage for something. Um, and obviously they have to work really hard to get there, but I think it's pretty cool. Last week, we, our subjective question was on what was your favorite long distance racing shoe? And I just wanted to give a shout out for a few of the people who commented again, it's only been a Actually, we released it on YouTube this morning, so there's not a lot of time. Usually, we'll have more time for to, to give some shout-outs, but I wanted to give out a shout-out to Kent M. Uh, he said for his half marathon, he likes the Asakini Endorphin Pro, but for marathons, it's the Adios Pro 2. And he's interested in trying out the Sky. And then we also have Paul Lewis. His marathon shoe was the Zoomfly 4, and his half marathon shoe was the Vaporfly 2. And I actually asked him, why he chooses to switch over from Vaporfly for the long distance. And he basically just said he started having some issues at those longer distances. He's done multiple, he's done at least two marathons in the Vaporfly, but with, he says it gets unstable for him and feels more fresh using the Zoomfly. So I think that's a cool example of somebody who is taking, maybe on paper, you might say the Vaporfly is better, but for him, he's having a lot more success in something different. So I think that's, that's, a, a cool little testimony there to something. So thanks to everybody who's been commenting and engaging with us on the subjective question. And this week we want to hear about your favorite Olympic winter sport. And if you have, you can even like post a video of like a cool event, but you definitely got to check out Nathan Chen and uh, Chloe Kim. They were phenomenal. Um, and it was really fun. Let's transition. Let's move on to our next segment. This is kind of the, the big thing of the day. We're talking about rocker sold shoes uh, and who they might work, work for and who they might not. And then we'll talk about how this evidence comes to be and what we can take from it and what we do in the face of uh, conflicting evidence. Matt, why don't we start with just a definition? Let's talk about what is a rocker sole for those who don't know what it is and you know, maybe where did they come from? So that's a very good question, a good place to start. So Rockered soles are not just one thing. Um, it's it's a couple different components, but the overarching thing is having obviously a curved bottom to the shoe where instead of some of the older models that we, we saw, maybe the heel was kind of straight down, it wasn't, it wasn't really rockered, and the forefoot was lower. Um, that's kind of before we had true rockers and then, you know, more shoes started having this toe spring or the upward curve here. Then you started getting more and more shoes that had this full length curve to the bottom. And the extreme version of this, probably the ones that most people are going to think of first, if you're asking a non-runner, is going to be something like the Skechers Shape Ups, right? That's a great example of a very much rockered sole that you land and it mm -hmm. rolls forward. Um, the, the biomechanical function of that is really to replace the natural rockers of the foot. So the the foot and ankle have a couple different things that make help make us efficient. Let me pull the cat hair off this foot. So the <laughs> curved heel here, that's called the heel rocker. Um, when you land, that's supposed to be rock, ro to help roll you forward. The second one is the ankle rocker, which is the tail cruel joint, and it helps roll forward here. And then the final one is the uh, forefoot rocker where your toes extend naturally and you can roll off there. So these are different mechanisms that allow for efficient forward propul or forward momentum. And so the rocker part of a shoe really is, is designed to kind of either replace that or accentuate that. And it's not just one part. Like I said, it's the heel bevel, it's, it's the toe spring, and then the geometry of how everything is set up there. So and this is, you're seeing more and more mm -hmm. of this design just simply because with shoes that are getting thicker and have more stack height, right? There's less flexibility, so you have to replace the rockers because if the shoe's not flexible, that part of the foot can't do its function, so you have to replace it. So that's right. the extended version of <laughs> yeah. rocker shoes. No, I think that's all super important, though. And I think one of the interesting pieces that I think gets confused a lot is the difference between toe spring and forefoot rocker. Mm -hmm. And so right. if we talk about that for a second, toe spring is when the where the platform that your foot is on, a toe spring is where the actual platform that your foot is on curves up. So it would be, right. the and, and that that is where your toes get put into a place of extension. Four foot rocker is where your toes may be staying flat on the platform, but the foam underneath goes from a thicker foam to a more narrow foam and 
curves upwards underneath your foot, not with your foot. And so we'll, we'll dive into what impacts that might have, uh, on us and our bodies. But when we, t- I think the, the piece of the rocker soles that have been shown to have the biggest impact on, well, I, maybe I'm going to take my words back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Let's start, let's start with the heel. I'm going to, I'm going to rephrase this. So let's start with the heel rocker. So if we look at the heel rocker on shoes, we see that via a heel bevel, what impact has been shown from biomechanical models and research studies? What does a heel bevel do to the body when they're implemented versus so if some, not? Some of the earlier stuff that came out wasn't really evidence based, but there's been that's that seems to continue to be talked about when I hear people mention this stuff. So I think it was Brooks and a couple other Brooks and Skechers and a couple other companies that suggest that having the beveled heel move your foot strike forward. I haven't seen any literature, peer reviewed literature that suggested that. Um, what it certainly does do is it can sk- kind of smooth out some of the transition when you when you have a rear foot strike, right? So the some of that impact peak that you might see might be a little bit less, right? It tends to smooth out some of the forces and improves your forward progression. Uh, Nathan, mm-hmm. what do you think? What have you heard? Yeah, and I think a few others is in, especially in the case where where foam is extended beyond the level of the shoe, a bevel prevents early contact with the ground. We know that our bodies prepare uh, prepare to land, and if you have what's called a posterior heel flare without a bevel, that early contact can lead to delayed. Uh, onset of your musculature that you use to absorb shock, and so that leads to quicker movement through different angles because your body ha- doesn't have pre-activation of your muscles for shock absorption. So having a bevel and allowing your foot to land on the ground when your body is prepared for it is a better situation than if there's a posterior hero flare and there's no bevel. Um, I think anecdotally from a just running in shoes that have a bevel versus those who don't, that those that don't, even going with like, you know, the... I just tested the Nimbus 24 and there's a minor bevel, but not a huge bevel. And I, I get a lot of irritation to my tibialis anterior, which is the muscles on the top of the foot and the front of the shin. Uh, those for me get irritated when I have a shoe that doesn't bevel away kind of that posterior flare, um, versus other shoes that do, I don't have that issue. Um, like even the, um, Saucony Ride 14, I think kind of in a similar category of shoe. So what, what are you about to say, Matt? I was going to say a good example of this, not to poo-poo on a shoe, but one of the shoes that I really struggled with was the Hoka Clifton Edge for that reason, that yes, it did have a, a, a heel bevel, but the the heel was so posterior that one of the things that you want to make sure is that you're hitting the ground at the right time. Because as Nathan mentioned, during normal gait mechanics, during the swing phase, which is when your leg is swinging through the air, right? And when you're about ready to hit the ground, your muscles, there's a certain timing that needs to happen. And the muscles in your lower leg need to kick on before you hit the ground. So they're ready to actually handle the impact and be able to eccentrically absorb that impact. The trouble with shoes that either don't have a great heel bevel or they have a ton of posterior flare is you end up hitting the ground first before the muscles are ready. And then it also changes the biomechanics and the kinematics of how you're landing. So like Nathan mentioned his anterior tibialis, which is the muscle that controls your foot falling forward. So if you land with a heel strike, your foot, the front of your foot coming down, that's controlled by the anterior tibialis. If you have a posterior flare or not a great heel bevel, that the arc of motion is now greater. And since you're moving the same speed, if not faster through that, that actually puts more torque through the ankle and through the anterior tibialis. So it does put more force through that. There's a couple other kinematic variables, including potentially causing your knee to drive forwards more, right? Just based on some of the physics of that. So we're not necessarily saying this is a bad thing. Some people actually do may do well in something like that, and they like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but just biomechanically, it's kind of not the most sound, I think, for a lot of people. Myself especially. I know Nathan and I both typically don't tend to do well with we shoes that are not. Problem. Yeah, we both don't do well with shoes that are not beveled. So, again, it just tends to put – it changes some of the kinematics and where forces go. Before we go much farther um... – the other side of the equation is if a bevel, a heel bevel is placed really far forward. I think an example right. could be the Max Road series, so like the Max Road 4 and 5 uh, from Skechers. And 
for me, um, other people have a phenomenal experience in that shoe. For for me, that bevel is further forward underneath the calcaneus, so it's not right at the heel. It's a little bit in, a little bit, and just with where I land, I feel like I slam into a speed bump and then I got to go up and over. And so the placement of a bevel compared to what your mechanics do is going to potentially make an impact on how you're running. But let's transition forward in a shoe from the heel all the way up to the forefoot. So let's talk about forefoot rockers and what have studies shown about what do forefoot rockers do to our bodies biomechanically. So there's, there's a couple variations here, but I'm going to stick with the big thing. So the biggest thing about the forefoot rocker is it un well depending on i'll get in that later yep <laughs> so again it replaces the forefoot rocker what this typically does is it means that your calves and your to- and your toes and your ankle joint doesn't have to work as hard to transition over this so people that have limited ankle dorsiflexion or limited uh first or, or metatarsophalangeal joint extension so that's your toe joints right can they extend or not it can help you roll you through that a little bit better so that typically tends to unload some of the calf muscles and can sometimes place force just a little bit higher but the biggest thing is it again replaces what may be lost um up farther and just has, yeah. requires a little less work from things like calves and some of those other propulsive muscles that would normally be very active at that point and so again it doesn't get rid of things you can't get rid of energy so just because you're using your calves less doesn't mean oh i get free energy it's that's going to go somewhere you're going to have to push and propel with another place right yeah it's interesting when asics dropped the original glide ride they did uh like a running experience out at the salt flats i think in utah i think and it was basically a competition to see who could run the longest without stopping and so uh they had that kind of piece of the marketing. And then they also use the phrase like scientifically shown to conserve energy or to save energy. Uh, And I talked about that in my review of the initial glide ride, but I think that that statement scientifically shown to conserve energy is true, just an incomplete sentence um, or incomplete thought or reality saves energy in the calf musculature right. uh, in the ankle. flat flexors yeah. because yeah. yes because that's there but you have to do something else to move forward it doesn't disappear um and that said i mean we know that there's we we can move for we'll, we'll eventually get here but there's potential economical advantages to having a rocker with a stiffened sole when it comes to race days as well but and we'll talk about all that stuff soon but i i think that the the glide ride is probably one of the most stark four foot rockers where the toe spring is pretty mild where your your toes aren't coming way up but it's a pretty aggressive one where i remember feeling like i was falling forward on that shoe and uh i I think breaking through the marketing of these whole rockers and efficiency is talked about all the time i think hoka they they operate off of rockers all the time and they talk about an efficient stride all the time and there's some truth to that uh but it's not as simple as saying rocker is better than non-rockered because it's not, it's not how it works. Go ahead, Matt. Right. It depends on the person. It's there. The research is very conflicted. I know we're going to get into this, but there's some that mm-hmm. says it does make you a little bit more economical. And some saying that's it, like running economy is not any different. So yeah. it doesn't mean it's not, it may not be beneficial. Just you have to be careful with that verbiage when you try right. to make blanket statements and that's people, mm-hmm. right? So people use different strategies for how they move forward If you have somebody move less from the ankle, guess where they're going to have to, they're going to start moving more from knee and hip. So, Mm -hmm. or somewhere else. So, yeah, we, we're not trying to poo poo on this, but just kind of trying Mm -hmm. to raise awareness going, please be aware that this really depends. Here are some of the mechanisms. Now it's your job to figure out how that might impact you. Right. Yeah. I, I think what's super interesting is I think when you look biomechanical model wise at these, they're, they're pretty solid to introduce. Mm-hmm. They're a nice thing to have in a shoe for a lot of cases. And we're going to talk about right. who's going to benefit from these in a second. Um, but before we do, I want to talk about one other element of rocker soles. You can have a shoe that looks really rockered, but it's flexible. And you can have a shoe that looks really rockered and is really rigid. Matt, what do you think about, do those perform the same and, and why or why not? Why would like a flexible, you know, rockered sole be different than a rigid rockered sole? Right. That's a very good question. Um, I think that goes back to the fact that we talked, uh, McClode and Jared Ward studied on optimal shoe stiffness. 
So there's a couple, a great example. I mean, we're going to talk about this shoe in just a second, but the Xstep X260, uh, which is Xstep's training model, um, has a solid amount of toe spring and forefoot rocker, but it's still fairly flexible through here. So um, yeah, it's going to be nice to roll forward, but you're still going to be able to get that toe extension through that midsole. So, you, you know, if you don't have that motion, that might be problematic. And if you do, and if you like that, that might be beneficial. Whether that truly affects efficiency is going to depend, right? Because every single person responds differently to different levels of stiffness. So those are a couple mm -hmm. different variables. So some people, right, they might like having that roll forward, but still want to get some bend there because they tend to work better with more flexible shoes. Others, mm -hmm. you know, may like it where you've got some of these racing flats that have that, but are just totally stiff and just you roll forward through there. So again, it's, my answer is usually it, it depends. It just depends on kind of those two different factors and what you like, right? It can, it might yeah. help you roll forwards, but if you still want that flexibility, that might feel better. Or if you don't like that, it might not. Yeah. And I, I think one other thing I want to add to this is when you look at the studies that look at the effects of rocker sole shoes on the calf, and we kind of talked about yeah. how there's decreased calf demand with the rocker sole, those are stiff rockers. So like when right. they, when they put them in the research study and they create these prototypes to kind of just mimic, I think that we'll get into this too, the way that these studies right. are done, they're not like bringing in a, a endorphin shift and having people run in that they're creating a prototype shoe for the sake of standardization. Right. And when they're doing that, they have a certain point in the shoe, uh, that the angle starts, they have a certain angle of the rocker and they have a certain stiffness. So the ones that show the decrease in calf have a stiffer sole to them. And so if you have a shoe like the, um, so you have the glide ride from ASICS, and then you also have the Trinusa or the Evo ride, the Evo ride and the Trinusa have a more flexible forefoot. I think it's pretty safe to assume that although they both have a pretty significant looking rocker, the, uh, effect on your calf is going to be significantly less in the Trinusa or the Evo Ride compared to the Glide Ride. Right. And that happens just the, the, the Evo, the Glide Ride just has such a thicker sole. And the other ones too are a little more in that performance trainer, almost right. racing esque type thing. So the naturally thinner sole. Right. Yeah. And I think the Glide Ride has a plate through the forefoot too. It's like a. Oh, like yeah. A I forgot about that. Shift. Yeah. Have you ever read about... the Glide Ride? I haven't. I, you know, it's funny. I was just looking at it last night and like, oh, that's. I I've never tried this. I wonder. I don't know if they're coming out with the three this year, but I feel like it'd be interesting to have you run in the two and see what you think. Yeah, I'll have to maybe see That'd if I can get a pair. One. Yeah, I like. I like. I enjoyed the two a lot more than the one. Mm -hmm. um, they did some three D geometry in the first one that they had a very uh, the two they had two layers of foam. The layer of foam on the inside was really built up through the midfoot, um, and then on the outside there was like a con like a cutout basically. And so the shoe is really laterally biased and I just felt right. wobbly in the heel. They totally widened out the whole thing and like made it a little bit more streamlined where it was just straight and it just functioned way better, a lot more stable in the second version. And I felt like you could get in rhythm without fatiguing out, but yeah, this isn't a glide ride review, but I do think it's a really good platform to talk about rockers. I th what would you say if you had to talk about training shoes that have the, what would be your favorite or you think the most appropriately integrated forefoot rockers in training shoes? Oh my gosh. That is a you on great the spot. question. I don't know if I have an answer on that. That's a really good question. It also depends on what train, cause I'm someone who trained in the noose to try. So, you know, that's right. a, I'm trying to think. Um, I've got a couple. I can, I can be the springboard for the conversation feel, if you want i feel like the the puma magnif magnify 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 it was magnify, magnify. was one of Mag magnify. was it magnify I could, oh shit. magnify is topo <laughs> magnify oh, my bad my bad um i think was one mm -hmm. of the ones that integrated that really well where it was a very thickly cushioned shoe and yet just the way they set up the rocker and sold some flexibility there was it was just integrated in the 12 was so smooth that was one of the ones i've that comes just to mind. There's lots of really good ones out there, but in terms of yep. one, it's what's hard to do is when you start getting stiffer and, you know, more significant, it's hard to not make it feel artificial, you know, cause yeah. for me, I, I, I come from a world where the Sockney Canvara is, was my trainer for years. And so getting used to some of the stuff still, even though I, we, I typically run more maximalist shoes now, 
Yeah, it's tough. Mm-hmm. I think the Magnify is probably one of the ones that integrate that really well. What about you? I'm curious. Yeah. I'll put you on I, the spot now. Maybe best isn't the right word. Sorry for yeah. putting that word in there. But um, yeah. in terms of a continuum, I think that one of... I think Hoka does a really nice job integrating a smooth four foot rocker. Um, you look at like the Clifton and Mach four and there's mm. a little bit of rigidity just because they're a little bit thicker sole and they have like the Mach four has that firmer EVA on the bottom. Right. The Clifton isn't like a super soft foam. So there's some security there. I think that's a, a like a, a more gradual, less aggressive, um, smooth four foot rocker. One step over, I think, is like the Saucony Endorphin Shift and the Axon, where you have, <clears throat> excuse me, you can feel the fo- the roll of that rocker a little right. bit more. It's a pretty rigid forefoot because of how much foam is there. And the Power Run foam is, is again, firmer. And then I think one step further, where it still feels good, but it's definitely more aggressive and feels like a falling forward, is that Glide Ride. So I'd say those would yeah. be my, my three, like Hoka's integration of the forefoot rocker, is the most gradual compared to the next step would be the endorphin shift and the axon. And then one step further is that glide ride, which is really from a training perspective is very rockered. You know, I I have to totally agree with you and take back. I think, you know, when you're talking about what's the best integrated, which is probably a better question. um, I would again have to agree with you on the endorphin shift is Mm -hmm. one of my favorite shoes and particularly for people that need that biomechanically, that's kind of one of my go-tos for going, this might be a shoe that's still, and that shoe is set up so well. I know it's not a review of it, but yeah, that, how Saucony does their, why do I forget what that is called? What do they call that again? Their speed roll. The speed roll. Yeah. <laughs> you so literally these, forget that every time. <laughs> I forget it every single time. Um, the speed roll design in the shift is one of my favorite, and I am I am really looking forward to version three on that. Same. Um, and I I think I like that because both it feels good, it is aggressive, but it also that shoe tends to work really well. And I think you've had a similar experience where it's worked well clinically for people that just need to unload that. And it gets another shoe that again provides a solid amount of like natural rigidity without truly being a post or stability shoe, but still mm-hmm. works really well. So I'd say. If I was going to choose one, it'd probably be the endorphin shift thinking yeah. about it now. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's the middle of the road where you can yeah. feel it, but it's not, it's not super aggressive. Also, we're going to transition into talking about who might benefit it, just with that little segue on using the endorphin shift a lot clinically, but we went to St. Louis for a wedding for, she, it was actually super cool. Um, she was a student of mine. I was her clinical instructor um, and she was a great student. And she invited us to their wedding down in St. Louis. And they actually had a stay. She had to stay at her parents' house. Like her parents invited us to stay at their home the night before, oh, the awesome. night after the wedding. It, was, it felt just like super, uh, I don't know. We felt very honored to like be there. Anyway, we went to this uh, brunch place in St. Louis called The Shack. Breakfast and lunch place. It was super fun. You could write. I think they wrote, a, <laughs> they wrote their like creating breakfast food as creating breakfast mood as an excuse to be able to drink in the morning or something like that. Like they want, that's like the way that they created their food. But regardless of anyway, I think uh, it was fun. You could write on the walls anywhere in the restaurant. So like people's names or like things were written everywhere. It was super fun. And they had really yummy, really yummy food. And this mug says, I, I like it when you call me big Papa from coffee. Um, I don't drink coffee, but Jana does, my wife does, and so she she wanted to get this mug, and sure. it reminds her of an SNL skit uh, that's like, "I like it when you call me Big Papa." It's yeah, like the is it Will Ferrell with I believe it's or something? I think it's Will Ferrell. Yes, yes. So I remember that skit. Somebody in the comments that. below remind us <laughs> what, who who that was. Yes. All right, let's dive back in. Who who is going to benefit from a rockered soul? I think let's focus this conversation more on the, that four foot rocker and more of the okay. rigid four foot rocker versus um, like the heel bevel stuff because the heel bevel is a different part of the conversation. Let's just talk yeah. about who's going to benefit from a four foot rocker. Right. Those are, even though we talk about rocker shoes, there are two different populations that will benefit from each of the different parts. So talking about the four foot and where that's unloading, which is, you know, and that's something that the rocker research typically focuses more on. There's not as much on the heel bevel, even though if you look at the literature, it'll say rocker they shoe. All they all mm-hmm. say the same thing, but when they're most of the time, if you dive into the method section, they're just talking about a lot of the mechanisms from the middle and the front 
of yep. the rocker. So, which is frustrating for those of us looking for evidence on the, the heel bevel, but that's a different which story. Which exists, it's just not as it's, much. It's not as much. People don't, mm. uh, not as much. Judgment. Anyway. But anyway, so those people <laughs> um, that are looking to shift work away from the foot and ankle. So this is actually the same mechanism for a lot of you that, you know, that may have, you know, suffered any kind of foot and ankle injury where you're in a boot. It's the exact same mechanism and reason why that boot is so curved upwards, right? So people looking to shift the work away from their foot and ankle and up to the knee and their hip, that population is going to be really, really good. So if you've got, you know, and I hesitate, we've had some conversations about, you know, if you do have an injury, can you run through it? So please listen to that and please use your best judgment. Um, but for those like kind of minor things here and there, if you're trying to get unload your foot and ankle, rockered shoes can be really, really effective. If you're someone that tends to be missing mobility, um, especially in your ankle joint. So if you have either stiff calves or a stiff tail accrual or your ankle joint, if you're missing um, first or first toe or general extension of your toes here, which does happen, some people do tend to lose that. Having a rockered shoe can help maintain forward momentum. So instead of trying to go over these things, which can be uncomfortable, that can be replaced with a forefoot rocker. So those people, again, missing mobility or maybe not having as good a calf strength as they might like, that's going to shift work away. But we encourage you that even if you are wearing this stuff, that you should still, if you can, work on your mobility and your strength in your in your feet, ankles, and, mm-hmm. and that area. But it might, again, people who have problems there can get a little work out of that. Yeah. I, what do you think? One other, one other, po- I was, I was going to, I mean, I agree there. I think yeah. clinically when, when people have a chronic Achilles tendinopathy, um, mm-hmm. one of the suggestions I give them is to at least get a rocker to shoe for their rotation. Yep. Um, and best case scenario is they can go try a bunch of different rocker shoes and see which one makes an actual difference on their symptoms. Right. Uh, so that, that's one of those populations i think the other one is people who have th- that first ray uh stiffness yeah. if it's through because of arthritis or whatever it is if they don't have and this is for runners and non-runners i give a lot of non-runners a rocker sole yeah. shoe in those scenarios where they yeah. have yeah and, and it and it's not changeable i have you know have right. patients who have rods through that first ray that have been surgically put in because of arthritic changes obviously those people aren't going to gain motion back or they have a, like they have a fusion basically there Right. Those people, I, I like to have a rigid rockered sole for them. And, you know, some of these are more walkable than others. So I think the endorphin shift is a nice one that's walkable. And I like to use that as, as a platform. Right. And it, But it's a little bit more aggressive than the Hoka. I think sometimes Hoka still has a little bit of flexibility. And some people do really well with it. Some people don't. And I, I agree with you. I had a, a gal who was running and hit a pothole and fractured, had a fracture for uh, fibula and then ended up needing surgery because it was a non-union, which means it didn't fuse back or it didn't heal on its own. And she had, uh, we gained a lot of motion back in her dorsiflexion, but she still was limited in there. And so um, she ended up getting a Clifton, um, which helped with kind of just getting her through that motion. She's also uh, a bodybuilder. And so she uses lower, you know, uh, flat platforms for that. And so she does work on her dorsiflexion as well. But for the running, she found that she just had no anterior impingement um, or like pain in the front of the ankle where it felt like it was pinching when she would wear a rocker uh, shoe for running. So that ended up working really well for her. One other population, I have a question for you, Matt. People ask us this one, so I wanted to bring it up. If I have plantar fascia pain or if I have plantar fasciitis, that's usually the question we get, should I wear a rocker shoe? Will that fix it? That's a, a great question, and the answer is it depends, as always, because plantar fascial pain is is very hard to. First of all, you got to make sure is it actually the plantar fascia? It's one of those areas that is misdiagnosed so many times. There's so many yes. structures in that area, whether it be nerve, muscle, or the actual plantar fascia itself, and some other ligaments in that area. You got to make sure is it the right thing, and then secondly, you got to make sure if you do, you know, a rockered shoe might help unload that but there's a couple things you got to make sure is and you know when we nathan did a good job of alluding to this earlier but when you have the shoe here that four foot rocker right here you got to make sure that you're if you're going to do that that your toes are not held in extension there are some shoes that the, the rocker tends to hold you up like this and your toes are held in extension which that's actually a test for plantar fasciitis called the windlass test where you yank some of the, the first toe into extension and then you poke their plantar fascia if it hurts 
that's positive. So you don't, if you're going to use a rockered shoe, your toes need to not be held up here. They need to be held in a neutral position to basically unload the tissue. So yeah. it might, right? So make sure that you, this is diagnosed correctly. And that's, ex that's actually what it is. And then in that case, you got to make sure you choose the right shoe that isn't putting more stress because just because it's got a rockered sole doesn't mean it might unload it. There's a couple other factors. Right. I think I think plantar fascia pain is a little bit it's a little bit less clear cut. I think some of those other ones we yeah. talked about mobility deficits in the talocrural joint or like yeah. the big ankle joint yeah. and the Achilles big tendon stuff too. Achilles is tendon really big. Those are yeah. more clear because all yeah. of that functions in what we call the sagittal plane. So they're all mm -hmm. if you're looking at someone running from the side. Whereas the, the plantar fascia is interacting with the foot, which has a ton of joints that move in all the different planes. So it's not, it's not as simple as putting one sagittal plane slab under your foot that has a rocker to it and fixing plantar fascia pain. There's a, there's a lot more that goes into it. So right. it's not a cure-all for that one. Uh, for the other ones, they can be a nice tool. And even for plantar fascia pain, it can be a nice tool, but it has to be the right one. Where, right. And, and that's where it gets into... if. We always say if you have pain that's ongoing and it's bugging you, you should just go see a PT who works with runners because right. if you can establish a relationship with them, they're going to eventually know you and know your body and know you as a runner. You should get to know them and they should get to know you so that you guys can work together when things pop up and you can get better recommendations than listening to us talk <laughs> for yourself because I think we can be a nice platform for the start of the conversation, but not everything actionable for individuals. Um, it would be fun someday if we could... We've talked about it a little bit, creating a platform where we're able to get really good video analysis and strength assessments virtually and like work with people actually. That'd be interesting. Yep. Anyway, that's not why we're here. So we're going to transition. Oh, we, we did want to talk about who might not benefit. Let's, let's kind of, is there anyone that pops into your head who might not benefit from a rockered soul? Who should stay away from them? So the people that I can think of that may not benefit are people, um, this is not always true, but I've had some experience with patients that have um, hip issues, right? So either they're missing mobility there or they might have some strength deficits just because these rockered shoes do tend to shift workload up to the hip. Um, and what can really be problematic is because of that toe spring or the, the forefoot rocker, you tend to get more hip extension as you go forward than you would otherwise. And so that can actually put a little bit of stress at the hip joint. So that might be someone that might want to be careful with that. And then people who, this is a term that I use. It's not been, it's not been used extensively in the literature. We talk about it frequently, but people that tend to really use a foot, a hip, or sorry, a foot and ankle strategy. So people that a lot of their running force and propulsion and shock absorption is coming from their foot and anchor, foot, foot and anchor. Foot and anchor. That's not the first time I've done that. That's probably like fifth or sixth time on this podcast that that's happened. Um, but the foot and ankle, <laughs> the anchor is actually, it's going to be my new, I'm publishing a paper on it. It's a, it's a subset of the foot. Oh yeah. That for I'm sure. just going to name after myself. All right. I think yeah, that, that's the thing you done. throw into the water to keep your boat in place. The anchor. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. That was better. My joke so wasn't the, good either. Wasn't I thought fun. that was okay. That was, that was I mean, better than arts and crafts. <laughs> no, I, arts and crafts got that was is, good. A ra gets rave reviews. I think All right, good. So, with the whole anchor thing, there's something there, yeah. but execution C minus B, D plus maybe. Okay, got it. All right. So going back, people that use a foot and ankle strategy, meaning that most of their propulsion, most of their shock absorption, they're just used to using their foot and ankle a lot. That might not be a good shoe for them because it's going to shift the workload away from what they're good at using. Now, if yeah. that's something you want to go, hey, I know I tend to use this a lot. I want to kind of work on maybe using some other joints and muscles, right? To just for like a, like a pseudo cross training effect. Great. But for people that don't want, don't like that or, and they don't want that shifted away and they don't want that artificial feeling, which can sometimes come with these, yeah. then that's probably not the best group. Nathan, what do you think? No, I, I agree there. I think there's, when it comes to who doesn't benefit, I think another yeah. group are those who have like, and this is like people with significant balance issues. Yeah. Um, uh. I think that having a, a platform like that has a, I think like I wouldn't put someone at a fall risk in a glide ride right. or in the max road because they just rolling forward and backward. I wouldn't want to have someone like that in a shoe that's less running. That's more like day-to-day -day stuff. Right. Um, but 
Did you I, have I, there on that on that idea? Yeah, I, I definitely I think the hard part is a lot of those shoes. It depends on what direction they tend to fall. So people that have that don't yeah. have very good posterior chain, so they don't have very good back strength or glute strength or hamstring strength or calf strength, so they can't restrain themselves when they go forward. That's the kind of person I wouldn't do for. But people that need like lateral stability, because a lot of these shoes that are rockered tend to really facilitate forward motion. And they restrict la- like medial lateral motion. And might be good. It just depends on which way people are going. But people that tend to fall forwards or backwards, probably not. Rocker shoes may not be the best option. You might want something that has a right. lack of a heel bevel just to create a little right. more stability. But that again, this is not usually runners. This is we're talking about kind of the, the patient Using population. The shoe at least, on the yeah. So we're talking about those with neurologic or those in kind of the older geriatric Parkinson's. that might have Parkinson's, right? That's who we're thinking about. Not necessarily. Um, running population. Sometimes balance deficits do come into play there. But yeah, that's something to think about. I think the other stuff you talked about in terms of what kind of strategy you use to run, I think that that plays in. And then just preference because a lot of these, to have a true rocker sold shoe that's giving you what the quote unquote benefits or at least biomechanical changes um, right. they are going to be higher stack. They're going to be a firmer sole. And so if you're a person that doesn't like that, then obviously you stay away from that. Um, and like we said, if you're having, if you're a person with issues up the chain, maybe you want something that puts a little right. more demand lower and takes them away. So, right. and we don't have perfect evidence for that one way or the other. And that is actually a great segment or segue into our next thing that we're going to talk about. Um, we want to talk about what do you do when you hear conflicting evidence on something where it says this is beneficial for decreasing injury or something. And then something else comes out and says, this is not beneficial uh, for decreasing injury. What do you do with that? And when you listen to us talk and you hear us talking about something, and then maybe a year later, you hear us say something that's opposite of that because new evidence came out. What do you, how do we handle that? So, I mean, you're, you're getting your PhD right now. You're Mm -hmm. in the world of research methods what would you say about the reality of conflicting evidence and how should we as consumers, as PTs, whatever, how should we handle conflicting evidence? I would say the reality of conflicting evidence is that it's normal, right? Um, you're always going to find, if, if you look hard enough, you're always going to find something that says one thing and then something that says the opposite. Um, some of the stuff that I'm studying right now is Achilles tendinopathy. And there's a lot of stuff out there that some things say, oh, this is what contributes to that. And there's other things that said, no, it doesn't. I think one of the biggest things I run into is whether gender has an influence on the development of Achilles tendinopathy, where kind of the standard thought for a long time was that men tend to have more risk of Achilles tendinopathy. And then some recent research just come out and said, no, there's actually no impact. So you have to weigh that. And so part of being a good consumer of research, whether you're a clinician, whether you're a researcher, whether you're, I almost said civilian, whether you're just a person... <laughs> I'm not military. All respect to our military. I, that is not an honor that I've gotten to have. Um, but uh, those who may not be in either one of those rules and are just trying to learn is that you have to understand that there is going to be differences and you have to start asking follow-up questions about going, okay, so this research said this research, this research said the opposite. Why? And that's when you need to start asking about how the study was done. So if they had two different subject populations, if their methods were different, yeah, that might make sense that they might come to different conclusions because there are subtleties about when certain things happen. And then the other thing is that we just learn more over time. We learn, you know, sometimes the older studies are really good. Sometimes they're flawed and we have to go back and redo that and we learn things. So if anything else, I'd say be ready for things to change and be able to adapt with it. And so, you know, during the process of writing my prospectus, there's been articles that have come out that I've added during that and going, you know, that now says this. So maybe I might have to go back and change based on the wisdom. I have to tweak some parts of my my proposed study because of this new information. And that I encourage you to think the same way is don't don't be so stuck on absolutes because the more we learn, the more things change. So be ready for that and just go on what's the best evidence. And if things conflict, ask why. And if they're done fairly similarly, you might have to see, is there more evidence for one thing versus the other, right? Because people make errors all the time. If a bunch of studies say, yeah, this is the way it is, and then there's one small study that says no, right? Until there's more evidence on that, you're going to have to probably go with the bigger one and then ask, why was this one different? Right. Yeah, I think those are great things. I think that posture of, I mean, it's basically a posture of humility to say, hey, 
the way I'm thinking about this right now might change because there's there's very little things even outside of the running world that we don't know just as in general. But I think that especially in in areas like this where like I said, I referenced this earlier, but studies on footwear are typically, not always, but typically done with prototype shoes that are developed to standardize something. So it's not a perfect representation of what you're putting on your foot when you go run your marathon or when you train for your marathon. And so you have to be able to loosely, you can't just perfectly take this evidence and slap it onto your your daily routine. It's not that easy. And I think that's where conflicting evidence could come is because prototypes that are developed might be a little bit different. Or like we... We just actually, Casper, our audio engineer, sent us a study today um, looking at, we, we've talked about this before, with cushioning. Does higher max stack, does cushioning, softer foams, is that better for you? Does it decrease shock, whatever? And there's been studies that talk about the reflexive stiffening of our joints. This study that came out in 2021 um, had a different conclusion that maybe uh, the amount, the type of foam and the foam underneath and the cushioning doesn't affect leg landing stiffness. And we started to dig into the, the questions that Matt just talked about, the why questions. What are the methods? Because are these two studies actually homogenous, meaning that they're actually looking at the same variables? And are they looking at the same methods? Because if they're not, then they might come to different conclusions. And you can't just read their abstract or read the conclusion and say, hey, this abstract says that you don't have reflexive stiffening. So now we got to go the other way. That's not that simple. You have to dig into the, the, the way that these studies were designed and what kind of conclusions you can draw from them. It's asking, are these homogenous? Matt, you referenced mm -hmm. too, is it the same right. populations? And if, if they're homogenous, then you, then you get to wrestle with that. If they're not, you get to create new categories in your mind for, for – uh, for these things and glean what right. you can. And sometimes studies just have bad methods. <laughs> you just, yep. you don't use it. That's one of the things that I'm teaching my students at APU right now, being able to be part of their, their research and their capstone projects is, you know, being a PhD student, I read a lot of methods and then oftentimes that's when I'll stop. So the two areas when I look at a research article is I will go to their methods and their stats because I want to know, did you do your statistics correctly? Because if you didn't, I, there's, I ha can't take anything from it. And then did you do your, does your methods make sense? Did you have random sampling? Did you do all the things that are really required to make sure that your data is good, right? And so I will often, get, I won't even, I'll like briefly read the abstract, then I'll go to the methods and then I'll stop reading because I'll be like, there's all these red flags. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can't really, because of what I'm seeing, I can't really take much from the study. So I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to move on to the next one because that, that has to be good. And it's hard to do, right, as somebody who may not be in the research world. But I think that's where I encourage you when you see someone make re reference a study and you're like, I don't know about that. Go look at it. Go, you know, try to see did what they did make sense. And, you know, it's unfortunate is sometimes these studies have very questionable methods and so they still get published. And it's like, so yeah. that's, that's, that's a different conversation. I but I think that's one of our goals too, is to yeah. be a, be a sifter of literature for mm -hmm. the people who follow us that we, we are responsible in the way that we read right. and delineate information about these things. So we hope to be a trust, trustworthy source of right kind of how we interpret research and right. we're not perfect. So we've probably right. screwed up in the past and we probably right. will screw up in the future. But, um, That's I think goes. something I'm excited to do, we are currently in the process of scheduling an interview with someone who conducts a lot of this research. And one of the things we're going to dive into with him is that question of how do you take the information from this as a runner, as a PT, as someone who's working in run specialty, how do you take the result of this study and actually use it in the day-to-day? -day? And can, even right. the question, can you do that can with you? this study? And when can you do that? So that's something on the podcast upcoming. We're really excited about excited about we that are. one. But yeah, um, no, I think, but we just wanted to touch that because there's going to be, thankfully, there's going to be new research done all the time. And hopefully our ability to measure variables that matter is going to get better, which is going to give us new information. So right. I hope that, you know, Matt, David, and I, and Andrea, and Megan, and Ryan, like we are all sensitive to the reality of change and are willing to learn. And hopefully we can share what we learn as we learn with you all. Okay, let's go to our final segment. We're going to review the XStep X260. Uh, so Matt, why don't you just tell us kind of an overview about that shoe, what it's about, and then we're going to dive into kind of our classic fit ride performance 
uh, stuff. Yeah. So the X Step two or X two sixty. I think some people have maybe seen or seen me review the the X Step X one hundred and sixty, which is their racing shoe. Um, there is another marathon racing shoe that's come out yet that I just decided not to invest in because it looked too unstable, and I'll touch on that in just a second. But this is their training uh, shoe. It's still lightweight, so this is if I was gonna like say what tell what this shoe was kind of like, it'd probably be like an endorphin speed, given that it's also using a Piba foam. There's a nylon, I believe a nylon plate, and there's just a little bit more flexibility, and it's a little heavier. So my size ten comes in at. Uh, 8.9 ounces, so it's not the lightest, but mm -hmm. it's still a lighter weight shoe, and the Pebo Foam does make it pop a little bit more. So kind of more along the lines of like a performance trainer, although they're marketing it as a trainer. And we have, you know, we have we have an audience like around the world, but yeah, we're in the United States. That shoe isn't typically available in the U.S. So how do you the like? There is a U that. yeah. There is an XStep US website, although be be aware that it is still getting shipped from China, I believe. So it is a Chinese company. So just know, don't expect this overnight. I think this took about two weeks to come. So and again, with the shipping delays and everything that's going on, that's that's much longer than normal. But just if you are interested, right? We don't have any financial ties to them. Um, that yeah, it just takes time zero. to order stuff. So I used yeah. to be a, how a much, person. That, how much was that one? Do you remember? I think it was one thirty-five, not including oh. taxes. So it wasn't That's bad for. Cheap. That's actually yeah, cheap was, compared to the speed. You compared it to the yeah, speed. Yeah, so a little cheaper. It was, it was pretty mm. good. There are some things that make it very different, though. So this is definitely not an endorphin speed, although it is somewhat reminiscent, and you you might realize that as we okay. talk through this. So let yeah, you talked about kind of the foam compound and everything. Yeah. Why don't we talk about fit? How does the shoe fit? And right. So we don't have much specs on this. The only thing I have is my own measured weight. I don't have anything like drop and things like that. Drop probably feels like it's in like the six to eight range. It doesn't feel super low. It doesn't feel super high. But addressing fit, it is very narrow. That was something I was surprised about. And the whole shoe, including the last, is extremely narrow, which I did not expect. The X-Step 160 was fairly normal despite being a racer. So people that have very narrow feet are probably going to like this. It is true to size, thankfully. So that's something I always get worried about, especially with purchasing stuff overseas. But so true to size, just very narrow. The mesh, I, my feet fairly, can adapt to a lot of stuff, but there is not a lot of width and not a lot of room on the platform. Like, I don't know, is it, can you see how narrow this thing is? Like, just I mean, yeah, I need a comparison. Like... Oh yeah, that, especially that midfoot. But even the forefoot's pretty narrow. Yeah, the whole thing. It's almost like the so, heel is like wider than the forefoot. Yeah, almost. <laughs> so fit very narrow throughout, but not less, especially in the forefoot. Heel and midfoot's a little bit more normal. And you can see that okay. just because the midfoot's like hanging over there, which is something I noticed that we'll talk yeah. about. So what about, narrow yeah, toe box, especially. Ride? Yeah, ride has been interesting. So I'm recovering from a probably a mild posterior tibialis strain, which is one of the muscles that helps control pronation. And I tend to pronate a little bit anyway. So I've actually been using this shoe as a training tool because it is one of the least stable shoes that I've run in. So when I put my foot on this, it goes all over the place. And that's partially because of the narrow of the sole. There is a plate in here, but it is very flexible, right? So it's not super stiff. Um, and then the sole is really soft. So I've actually been using it for short runs to help train my post tib, which does get sore being in this. So ride wise, not stable at all. Um, the Piba foam is noticeable. It's softer, I think, than shoes like the Saucony Endorphin Speed, where it's just oh, got okay. a it's got a little more give to it. Because that give, it's a little less responsive, so it feels like I kind of sink in nicely. I don't bounce as much, although you can pick up the pace. It just it's not really stable enough for me. There is a solid heel bevel. Um, you know, your foot does. These are side walls, so they, the heel does stay in there. It's just. You know, I think this could be better if the sole was a little narrower. So I'm having a probably a slightly different experience if somebody had a narrower foot and like that because my foot is wobbling right. all over the place. And it's a little bit softer, not like a super cushion shoe soft, but it's just not quite stable enough for me for, to use for longer efforts or super fast yeah. efforts. Yeah. What about the, like, so it has kind of that, you know, uh, four foot rocker design. Do you feel that rocker or does it feel pretty yep. flat because of the flexibility? It, it feel, I wouldn't say it feels, it, 
I don't really notice it again because there's so much flexibility here. Oh, wow, that flexes um, a lot. Thank yeah. goodness... Yeah, thank goodness there is a nylon plate. I cannot imagine what this would be like without the without the nylon plate in here because I think that would just be everywhere. So there is yeah. some structure to it, which is better. But yeah, I really haven't noticed this. I think I just kind of roll forward and it feels... The toe-off actually feels pretty natural, which is, is okay. really, really nice. So people that land up front are probably going to really, really like this shoe. Is it uh, fuel cell soft or is it not quite like... No, it's, it's not that soft. It's... Okay. Is it is it a? It's not even peanut? rebel soft. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's it's a so almost one. exactly. Yeah, almost exactly like some of the Sockney's, uh Power Run PB stuff. Okay. Just so a little bit softer. That, in my, just softer. My mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just soft that. So if you like that, if you have a narrower foot, stability is not an issue for you, and you just want a little bit more flexibility, yeah. that might be a good consideration for you. Just know if you order this, it's going to take some time to get to you. Is it the shoe that has two different colors for each shoe, or is that a different one? Because they do a lot of funky color uh, stuff. Like, even the shoe you have has, like, a ton of colors on one shoe. Um, you know, you have, the like, a blue one the, and a red one? Like, one of the shoes yeah, you got the, had two the, different colors. These too. actually do oh, it is also that do do that. Yeah, it is that one. The yeah. X-Step 160X2 also did that as well. That was actually pretty cool. So, I got to give them kudos That's for fun. having two different colors. Yeah, it's just reversed the kind of yeah what is that called when it fades what's the color what is that called somebody tell i have us no idea in the chat in the comments. somebody tell us in the comments when it fades from one color to another it's called something yeah i can't remember um but anyway yeah anything else you want to add about the the x step x260 yeah you know i think it's going to work for a certain population um it's definitely I have to say, overall, I am fascinated by what's happening in China. I know a lot of people will say, oh, you know, they're copying stuff. But you're seeing some very interesting innovation in there. I wish there was a little bit more trade just because it'd be nice to test some of that stuff. I know in terms of factory and ethics, some of that stuff may not always be the great. So it's a kind of a careful area to, to transition in. But I am I am curious to see what's happening in terms of design. And so this has actually been fascinating. I did like the X-Step uh, uh, 162. It was really good. wasn't the fastest, but it's cool to see other companies starting to mess with this stuff. Because in the U.S., like we're seeing more companies trying new foams, but there's also a lot of companies that are not and are still. And there's nothing wrong with EVA, but they're still using EVA and saying, "Oh, this is the fastest shoe." And it's like, you know, we need a little bit more innovation here in trying some of the stuff. So it is exciting to be able to experience other like Piba foam and go, "Hey, what's happening? What is this company doing?" What are the biomechanics behind that? So it's it is fascinating to observe. Just maybe not the best shoe for someone with biomechanics, but I'm still gonna get miles, and we'll still re have a full review of these. Yeah. Would you say it's? I I'm gonna ask like, is it worth the value that you paid for it? You know, is it for a buy one... it? Is it a try it? Is it a throw it away? Like yeah, a modification of the Ginger Runner scale. Um, yeah, exactly. Shout out Ginger I, Runner. Yeah, I don't. The hard part about this is you're not is, gonna find this his... in the U.S. What is his? Scale it's a again? it's a try it's a try it's a buy try or a why I think it is what okay, it is. I like that. Or I like, I like that. the why. It's like why would you do this? Um, <laughs> shout Ginger Runner, by the way, one of the one of the people that inspired uh, Klein Runs deep with your doctors are running and they're in the yeah that was your sense. thing. Yeah, it was Pete Larson from Run Blogger and the Ginger Runner Ethan Newberry who who inspired a lot of this long time ago. Yeah. But I think it, this is a hard one because this is not going to be able, available in the United States, and I don't think you're going to be able to do returns. So I think you're going to have to figure out, do you have mechanics to do this? And that's going to be, hey, buy – right? it's 135 so compared to some of the other stuff out there, it is cheaper. So it might be like, hey, if you have the finances, it might be an interesting thing to try. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, unless you have a super narrow foot – I kind of have a hard time saying, oh, you should definitely try this one over something like the Endorphin Speed, which is much more widely available. That might be yeah. changed so they get more miles on this, but that's my honest opinion at the moment, just given how unstable it is. Because I would certainly right now pick the Endorphin Speed right. over this if I had limited funds and didn't have the connections that, you know, we. this was a personal purchase, right? But we did, where we did get the Endorphin Speed for free. And I think yeah. that I would still probably choose the Endorphin Speed personally for my mechanics. But right. We'll have a full review coming up soon as I get through this and hopefully don't break my ankles. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's hope not. You I'm might just need kidding. A rock or soul if you do, if you have yeah, a, I might, a, a yeah. union. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. We are going to wrap yep. up the 75th episode today. Uh, we had a great time 
chatting about this stuff, kind of a fun topic to go through. Rocker Sold Shoes, talk a little bit about the research methods besides behind this stuff. Love to hear your answer to our subjective question about, um, what was it? Oh, Olympic, Winter Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> Excited to hear your Winter Olympics stories. Maybe you've seen some stories that we haven't seen yet, and that would be awesome. And then finishing off with this X Step review. If you want to follow what we're doing, as always, check us out on com, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, we also have a Pinterest. I always like to throw out a random one if I can, but check that out if you want to. Otherwise, um, as, as we always say, it really helps to leave a review. I think I've asked people to leave a review for the last, I don't know, I don't know how many weeks, but we've gotten zero extra reviews. So I don't know, this might be wasted breath and that's okay. Um, we're just glad you all are along for the ride. But if you can spare a couple seconds, it does help move the podcast forward and we'll catch you guys next time. Right. If anything else, it's Nathan is practicing his diaphragmatic training. So, you know, it is, it's good practice for him too. <laughs> That'll probably get cut out. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Bye everybody. Bye.